Well, we've been lighting the Advent candles every week. Every week we light a different one. I'll try not to burn the church down. <laughs> What's that? It comes as close to your sleep every week. <laughs> they worry because they're closest. <laughs> okay, the first candle was the prophecy candle or the hope candle. The second candle was the Bethlehem candle or the love candle. Glad I've got more matches here. The third candle was the shepherd's candle. And I'm going to light my sleeve on fire. <laughs> and it's also called the joy candle. And this week, we light the peace candle, which is also called the angel's candle. And this last one, this white one, we will light Christmas Eve, because that's the Christ King. And that's when he came, his first advent. And I'm not going to ask if there's any questions, because I wouldn't answer them even if you asked. No, I wouldn't. Anyway, I really love this custom. Do you like it? It's good. Okay, and I'm glad there are people in this church that remember to blow out the candles. <laughs> Merry Christmas, by the way. Merry Christmas. Who has relatives coming in? always fun this time of year to see our family. Okay. Let's say a quick prayer before we begin. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the wonderful things it teaches and uh, the wonderful stories of our Savior's birth and life. Lord, bless the message this morning. Bless it to each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A kindergarten teacher was suddenly taken ill, and a replacement was quickly found. The substitute teacher was at a loss as to what to do with the children. So she decided to tell them stories. And at the end of each story, she would say, the moral of that story is this. Now, after dozens of stories, the children had sat through dozens of morals. <laughs> So when the regular teacher got well and returned to class, uh, one of her students said, I'm glad you're back. I, I like you better than that other teacher. The teacher was flattered, but she was curious. Why do you like me better than the other teacher? The child looked up at her and said, because you don't have any morals. Oh. <laughs> are definitely capable of saying the darndest things. Children can be exasperating or surprising. Uh, some are downright special. Today we're looking at the most special of all. The title of the message is taken from a song uh, title about him. The song, uh, the Christmas song, What Child Is This? The song is a sermon all in itself. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him on, the babe, the son of Mary. The part of the Christmas story in today's scripture, in chapter two of Luke's gospel, is particularly instructive in respect to the sort of child Mary's baby was and is still. We see five things about him in Luke's account. First, let's look at the setting. 
We'll start in verse 8. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Literally, it is, they feared with a great fear. They were terrified. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. Um, Billy Graham once said that there are 365 fear nots in the Bible, one for each day of the year. I always thought that was fun. The next two verses here are the real heart of the message today. And some have outlined them with a when, what, where sort of outline. Ours is about who he is, according to the titles given him by the angel. The first of these on your outline is he is the son of David. The son of David. The title here is given indirectly. In the first verses of Luke 2, we find that Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem from some distance to enroll in a census for tax purposes. Uh, this was called for by a decree from Caesar Augustus, the emperor requiring everyone to register in their own city. Joseph was of the house of David, whose home city was Bethlehem. Do you think it was coincidence that Micah prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem? Of course not. God, in his sovereignty, sent everyone traveling all over the empire back to their hometowns by moving an emperor to come up with a bizarre plan for raising his taxes that would put two Galilean peasants right where they needed to be to fulfill that prophecy from 700 years earlier. That, uh, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. One of the titles uh, this prophesied child was given in those days by the common people, uh, the Jews, uh, before the king, was the son of David, the son of David, because he was in the family line of King David. And Luke 2 verifies that in verse 11, uh, in what the angel proclaimed, he said, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. He is the son of David. The second thing about him is that he is the savior of the world. The savior of the world. A savior born to you, the angel said. The you there is considered to be the Jews, the Jewish people, God's chosen people. But others think that when the angel spoke of good tidings to all people, there was a hint of all the people of the world, which has certainly been the result. It's coming out everywhere into all the world. Uh, Paul took the gospel to the Gentiles. Jesus came to save the lost, not willing that any should perish. When the angel spoke to Joseph in his dream, he said, you should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means Savior God. He was God who was our Savior. He left heaven to die for our sins. There's a story of a pastor who fell asleep in his office, couldn't be me, and <laughs> dreamed that Jesus never came. He dreamed that Jesus never came. And in his dream, he was called to a home where someone had died. And he uh, went there to comfort the family, and he turned in his Bible to find words of comfort and assurance but, but the Bible ended with the last book of the Old Testament. No New Testament, no Savior, no heaven. But it was only a dream. We do have a Savior who died for our sins and conquered the grave. 
for himself and for all who believe in him. The third thing about Jesus is that he is the Messiah of Israel. The Messiah of Israel. There is born to you this day a Savior who is Christ, said the angel. In the original Greek, it is Christos. It is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word for the Messiah, Mashiach. It means anointed one. Kings were anointed and priests were anointed. It signified a mission, a calling for a purpose. Jesus often spoke of being sent by his Father with works to be done. The Messiah would be a deliverer and the Jews expected him to come and deliver them from the dominion of Rome, but instead he would deliver them from the dominion of sin. Paul said, sin shall not rule for him. We, when we are saved, are freed from sin. It is overcome. Coming into the Christmas season, our term for that year, a time of year, is Advent. And we have, we have the lighting of the Advent candles, anticipating the coming, or Advent, of our Lord. That's what it means. There was his first coming, which we celebrate as Christmas, and there will be his second coming, which we call his return. Uh, he, he will come back and set all things right. He will set up his kingdom on earth and reign for a thousand years. Turn to the book of Isaiah in your Bibles. Book of Isaiah, Vermont, chapter 61, verse 1. Isaiah 61, 1. And I am going to read this from the New Revised Standard Version because it uses the word favor instead of acceptance. It is the Messiah who is speaking here. Verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. The Lord has anointed me and sent me. And Jesus came and fulfilled all those wonderful works prophesied in verse 1. But verse 2 is a loaded prophecy. Do you recall the words of Peter that with the Lord a thousand years is as a day? and a day as a thousand years. Verse two is that sort of prophecy. It is about the two advents of our Lord. His first coming was the year of the Lord's favor, the beginning of the age of grace, and the day of vengeance of our God will be his second coming. Turn to Luke 4, 16. Luke 4, 16. When he came to Nazareth, Jesus, that is, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Here's the Messiah reading his own prophecy. And Jesus deliberately stopped at the year of the Lord's favor. 
the time of God's grace, bringing salvation to lost sinners. The day of vengeance will come when he returns. And so we now have talked about Savior and Messiah, and we now come to number four. He is the Lord of all creation. Lord of all creation. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This is a combination of Greek words, Christos and uh, Kurios. It's actually Christos Kurios, a form not found elsewhere in the New Testament. But the titles are found together in Acts 2.36, when Peter says, God has made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Lenski says the titles must be considered separately. Lord in the Greek, that Luke, uh, that Luke was written and he wrote it in Greek, is kurios, normally used for God. In Hebrew, the word Yahweh. But in the case of Jesus, the angel would have called him Adon, the name used for Jesus in Hebrew. Uh, Jesus asked the Pharisees about the Christ one time, saying, whose son is he? In Christ, whose son is he? And they answered, the son of David. Then he said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. In Hebrew, the words are Yehovah, said to my Adon, sit at my right hand. This was the word for Jesus as Lord, Adon. Uh, the significance of uh, Jesus' use of that scripture from Psalm 110 was that David's personal Lord, who he said in the 23rd Psalm was his shepherd, was more than his son. He was one of the persons of the Godhead, the Trinity. It was a father-son conversation in heaven. Lutsky said the shepherds would have understood Adon in the same sense as they understood the Messiah. He was the Lord of believers from the very start, the Lord of creation and Lord of our lives. When doubting Thomas felt the nail holes in his hands, he worshiped saying, my Lord and my God. The last of these things about this child is that he is the king in the manger. The king in the manger. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. There is some wonderful symbolism here. The sheep the shepherds were watching here are thought to have been those that would be sacrificed during the Passover. And Paul said that Jesus is our Passover lamb. In cold weather, shepherds would wrap lambs in swaddling clothes to keep them warm. And now this baby would be wrapped in them. And this would be a sign to them. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. When the wise men came, they were seeking the one born king of the Jews. He who, according to the prophecy of Micah, was in God's words to rule his people Israel, a king. What a contrast to the birth, uh, the birthplace of Jesus was to that of earthly kings. Can you imagine? One of the writers of the Daily Bread wrote, a stable, what a place to give birth to the Messiah. The smells and sounds of a barnyard were our Savior's first, Savior's first human experience. Like other babies, he may even have cried at the sounds of the animals and the strangers parading around his temporary crib. Uh, there is a Christmas hymn called The Birthday of a King. The second dearest words are these. 
'Twas a humble birthplace, but oh, how much God gave to us that day. What a perfect, holy way. Hallelujah, oh, how the angels sang. Hallelujah, how it rang. And the sky was bright with a holy light. Twas the birthday of a king. I remember that. Uh, I, uh, I like to sing that because it's the right pitch. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 9 says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sins he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Regardless of his humble birth, he was the king of kings. I don't know if you've read much about Queen Victoria years and years ago. Uh, she was a fine young Christian. And when he, she had just ascended the throne, she went, as was the custom of royalty, to hear Handel's Messiah. She had been instructed about her conduct by those in the know. Supposed to go like that when you say and was told that she must not rise from her seat at the beginning of the Hallelujah chorus, which was not befitting royalty. But when that magnificent chorus was being sung, and the singers sang those four powerful hallelujahs, and then the words for the God, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. She sat still with great difficulty. It seemed as if she would rise, in spite of the custom of kings and queens. But finally, when they came to the part in which with a shout, they proclaimed Jesus King of Kings, suddenly the young queen rose and stood with bowed head as if she would take off her own crown from off her head and cast it at her master's feet. I was privileged to sing Handel's Messiah in the choir on Christmas Day in the early 80s in Tucson, one of my greatest memories. And the Hallelujah Chorus, wow. Oh, that everyone could know Jesus and the thrill at the sound of it. Do you know him? You are so rich if you do, and so very poor if you don't. He came to give his life a ransom for you. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Only he can take away your sins, and in their place he gives you eternal life and says, you will never perish, and no one will snatch you out of his hand. He is Savior and Lord, and you should make this Christmas when you turn from, to him from your sins and invite him into your life. Have you done that? Don't waste another day. Savior and Lord, lover of your soul, do you know him? Let's sing our last song. Or let's just sing Hope the Old Holy Night again. I love that song. I can't sing it because she sings it every year. It's a good tenor song.
receive candlelight service on the 24th at 6.30. And uh, somebody's going to get dunked at the end of the service. And uh, Christmas Eve is always exciting. We, we've seen people get saved on that night. We've seen our greatest number of people come on Christmas Eve. We had over 100 one time. So you might have to scoot over, okay? <laughs> and it's just a delightful time. It's a short service so that you can get home to your family and spend time with them. So come and celebrate Christmas Eve with us, okay? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the Christmas story. Lord, I have known people that it is a tradition with them to read it every Christmas with their family. And Lord, it is so important to us to remember that wonderful night. Angels from on high come to visit us. And then the greatest person in heaven coming to be one of us. What a, what a wonderful thing to celebrate. Lord, bless each one as we leave today and help us to remember the real reason for the season. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Was that loud enough, Monty? No.